Carbo and his family huddled together, whispering in hushed tones. Several other families were present, all gathered in the dark safety of the cave. They had been on the run for months, moving from one hideout to the next, always evading the snake people who hunted them relentlessly. Fear gripped their hearts, but tonight something was different. There was hope. The families had been searching for someone, a medium who could communicate directly with the gods. Now, finally, in their midst stood a seer, a figure cloaked in mystery. His voice was raspy, like wind passing through dry leaves. The gods will answer your prayers, the seer said, but you must choose the god or goddess who will bring about the end of the snake people. Choose wisely. The group exchanged anxious glances. One man spoke up. We should summon the god of water or fire. They will destroy these creatures once and for all. A murmur of disappointment swept through the crowd. Water and fire were powerful, yes, but their wrath was indiscriminate. Innocent lives would be lost too. What about the lion god? Another voice suggested. He is fierce and powerful. Cabo, who had been silent until now, felt a stirring in his chest. He cleared his throat, drawing everyone's attention. We have seen what the snake blood has done to those snake people, he said. It has distorted their humanity, turning them into monsters driven by an endless hunger for human blood. If we summon the lion god or any animal god, we risk becoming no better than them. The group shifted uncomfortably. I propose we summon a goddess. She will allow us to keep our humanity. A goddess? One man asked, sounding unimpressed. Yes, Cabo replied firmly. A goddess whose senses are sharper than the finest blade, whose strength rivals that of a dozen men. Her steps are silent as the wind, and her skill with weapons is unmatched. She is fierce, a protector of the very forests that shelter us now. The group leaned in, their interest peaked. The fire crackled in the silence, and all eyes were on Cabo. Who is this goddess? Someone whispered from the back. Cabo lifted his voice his heart pounding with the weight of his decision. I propose we summon the goddess of the... The people edged closer, holding their breath, eager to hear the name that could change everything. You are watching the Tales of the Savannah. Subscribe and be part of the tribe. Now let's get back to the story. Meanwhile in the heavens, the gods and goddesses sat in tense silence, each one waiting, each one hoping. They had all been summoned to witness the unveiling the moment when the people would choose the god or goddess to defend them. For those who embodied strength and power, it was a moment of anticipation. To be chosen would be a great honor. The snake goddess knelt before the great god, her heart pounding in her throat. This position, one of humility and submission, was all too familiar to her now. She had created the snake people, these demigods, and now she feared the consequences of that choice. Gods and goddesses, the great god began, his voice rumbling through the heavens. I have summoned you because my people have cried out. The veil has been opened. With a wave of his hand, an image appeared, a vision of Carbo and his group, desperate and weary, crying out to the heavens. The seer stood among them, holding a blade above a trembling goat, ready to make the sacrifice. Snake goddess, this day should not come as a surprise to you. It was foretold when you created the demigods, these creatures of darkness. The snake goddess's mind raced. Who will they choose, she thought. Suddenly her thoughts were interrupted by the seer's blade slicing through flesh, followed by the soft sound of blood hitting the ground. The gods and goddesses watched in silence, holding their breath, waiting for the seer to speak. We call upon the hunter goddess, the seer cried out, his voice echoing through the heavens. Hunter goddess, protector of the forest and the wilderness, we ask you to be our defender. Time seemed to freeze for the hunter goddess. The room of gods erupted in cheers. This was the greatest honor a god or goddess could receive. The people had chosen her. Hunter goddess, come forward. The people have spoken. They have chosen you as their defender. Serve them well. I have no doubt in your abilities. The hunter goddess stepped forward, her voice steady. It is a great honor, my lord. I will serve them with everything I have. A swirling vortex of light surrounded her, and in an instant she was gone, swept away to answer the people's call. The snake goddess felt a wave of defeat wash over her. This was worse than she had ever imagined. 
The hunter goddess was highly skilled, her precision unmatched. There would be no mercy. She collapsed to the floor, weak and trembling. This could very well be the end. Zoro, Sia and Tendai stood silently before the river, their eyes scanning the still glassy surface. They had been told to meet Mami Abeni here, by the water. It was well known that Mami Abeni's healing powers came from the mermaids, but now, as they stared at the unmoving water, doubt crept in. Tendai broke the silence, his voice low and trembling. Grandfather, I'm sorry for letting the boy go. I couldn't let him suffer for my sake. Zoro's eyes flashed with anger. Not now, Tendai, he growled, just as the first ripple appeared in the river. You went behind my back and your father's. There will be consequences. Before more could be said, Mami Abeni appeared on the riverbank, her clothes dry as if she hadn't just emerged from the depths. Her presence silenced the argument, her aura commanding respect. I have consulted powers greater than my own, Mami Abeni began, her voice smooth but heavy with authority. They will help you. The snake within the boy will be restrained, held in the water for seven generations. But on the eighth, the curse will resurface, only if the descendant of Tendai encounters a transformed snake person. If not, they will live a normal life until activated. The men stood frozen, the weight of her words settling in like stones. This was their relief, their salvation. Tendai's bloodline would be free, at least for a time. Zoro finally spoke, his voice steady, but filled with curiosity. What debt do we owe for this great favor? Mami Abeni smiled, a mysterious glint in her eyes. My friends, the mermaids, ask for a task to be completed in return, she said softly. Zoro and Sia exchanged uneasy glances. We are all ears, Mami Abeni, Sia said, his voice cautious. There is a powerful plant that grows high in the mountains, Mami Abeni explained. The merfolk need it for reasons I cannot share with you. Many have gone to retrieve it, lured by promises of riches, but none have returned. The merfolk offer you something far greater than riches. They offer life, seven lifetimes over, she said, looking at Tendai. Her words hung in the air, but Zoro felt his chest tighten. He knew the dangers of the mountain. Mami Abeni, he began, we have heard of the shape-shifting witch who guards this plant. She doesn't let anyone come near it. Mami Abeni's smile widened as though their fear amused her. Good, she said then you are more prepared than most. She continued, her voice firm. The plant glows brightest and is most potent during the full moon. Go now, may your goddess guide you. Without warning, Mami Abeni stretched out her hand and took Tendai's. Together they disappeared into the water, the river swallowing them whole as if they were never there. Zoro felt a sharp sadness. Maybe he should have been kinder to Tendai. This could very well be the last time they ever saw each other. With heavy hearts, Zoro and Sia turned away from the river and set off toward the great mountain, knowing that their journey had only just begun. The hunters gathered in a quiet clearing, their faces shadowed by grief as they paid their final respects to their fallen brothers. Jengo stood at the front, his heart breaking as he said his last goodbye to his twin brother. They hadn't always agreed, but their bond had been unshakable, built on years of trust and love. Now that bond was shattered. He felt Nandi's hand on his shoulder, her presence a constant support. He was grateful for her, but his mind wandered. Where is Nala? he wondered. He hadn't seen her all day and it gnawed at him. He scanned the crowd, searching for his daughter, but she was nowhere to be found. Have you seen Nala? he asked Nandi, a hint of concern creeping into his voice. Nandi smiled, trying to reassure him, I'm sure she's here somewhere, she said softly, but her words didn't ease his worry. Something didn't feel right. Meanwhile, far from the gathering, Nala stood alone on the beach, the wind whipping through her hair. The air was filled with the scent of the snake people. Her father had lied to her. She could feel it in her bones. He had told her that Kwame's body couldn't be recovered, that it had been too dangerous. But Nala knew her father well, and he never left a brother behind. It was the creed of the Brotherhood. Something was wrong, and she couldn't shake the feeling that her father was hiding the truth. Her eyes narrowed as she gazed at the horizon. Questions churned in her mind. 
and with each passing moment, her resolve grew. Kwame hadn't been killed. He had been taken, captured by the snake people. She was sure of it now, and if her father wouldn't act, she would. Determination surged through her veins as she made her decision. She would find Kwame. She would rescue him, no matter what dangers awaited. Without a second thought, Nala turned away from the beach, disappearing into the forest. The scent of the snake people was strong, and she followed it, her heart pounding with a mixture of fear and fierce resolve. And that, my dear tribe members, is the end of yet another episode in our Snake People series. Let me know your thoughts on this episode and what your predictions are for the future. If you haven't already, be sure to check out the compilation videos of Season 1 and 2 of our Snake People series. Some of you have asked me to continue the mermaid story. I am considering it and will keep you posted. Thanks for watching and stay tuned for more. And as always, thank you for watching our story and we hope you enjoyed it. What lessons did you draw from this story? Share your thoughts with us in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe and be part of the tribe. Thank you for watching The Tales of the Savannah. We will see you next time in the Savannah.